to welcome everybody to the April 16, 2014, Town of Scarborough Council meeting, 7 o'clock, a little after. Would everybody join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Roll call. Councilor Holbrook? Here. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Blaze? Here. Councilor Benedict? Here. Chairman Sullivan? Here. Okay, uh, item four, which is general public comments. You have three minutes. Name and <coughs> address of where you live. You have to bear with me in my cold. Um, we have <coughs> five, um, five public hearings tonight, and I'd like to try, if everybody, everybody's going to be able to speak at each uh, of the uh, <clears throat> orders. So try to, at, you know, if you're here to talk about the school um, budget, then I would ask that you, sp you know, would speak during that, uh, the public hearing. If you're here to talk about the uh, animal control ordinance or horses on the beach, I wish you'd hold your comments till that time. So anyone else that wanted to talk about any other issues in town would talk now during the uh, general public comments. Let me start. <coughs> Three minutes. Good evening. My name is Bud Hanson. I live here in Scarborough and Conham at 22 Stony Creek Drive. I am also the chairman of the Senior Advisory Board. And I wanted to announce to you all that on May 7th, the Senior Program Advisory Board have reserved a space for the Senior Expo at the Maximilian Colby Church. And I wanted everyone here to know that that is going to happen. We have a sponsor named Fred Emerson, who has sponsored the cost of us being there on the 7th of May, which is a Wednesday. Um, as you know, or maybe you didn't know, is that Hallie Hodge, our town coordinator, is helping us make arrangements for this event. It starts at 9 in the morning on, at, on May 7th at Mashman and Colby Church, 9 to 4. And I hope that you all can come. You don't have to be a senior to come. We want everybody to come. There will be businesses people there and all kinds of lovely people to talk to. We are hoping that maybe uh, our listening audience out in TV land will also get this invitation. Please come. We all would enjoy it. I'll repeat again one more time. It's on uh, May 7th, which is a Wednesday, 9 to 4 at the Maximilian Colby Church. Uh, and I hope that, uh, hope, I thought maybe Fred Emerson would be here tonight, but maybe he decided to stay home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Uh, my name is Robert Rovner for King Street Scarborough. Um, I'm here to really talk about the budget and probably going to overlap a little bit on this school. I'll try to make that very, very, very brief. But I'm going back to the April 11th edition of The Leader, um, written by uh, Michael Kelly, where he talks about a, uh, an increase that's going to affect all of us in town, $300 a, a home. I don't quite get it. Um, there was an article previous week where the town manager was quoted as saying we needed 13 new jobs, positions in town, various positions. There was a new budget of requiring 800 to $900,000. I don't get it. You don't have the money. We don't have the money. I don't understand why the word moratorium on spending has never been issued or heard by anybody in the audience and all the time I've been attending these mediums, meetings. There was a comment by one counselor about flatlining this year, and yet we're moving on with the process. School comes in, 38 million last year after, after three votes, wants 4 million more. We don't have it. <coughs> What's wrong with skipping a year? I read articles in the paper where kids, people have kids in school have to share their books. I don't get it. $38 million to 3,600 kids. I'm sorry, it doesn't make any sense to me. The other thing <clears throat> that I don't quite understand is that in all these articles that are being written, I never hear a comment or a suggestion 
by any counselor about where we can cut an item from the budget. We never hear about an item. And I suggested to the town manager a year ago, let's put in some, some um, meters in town. I've never heard a suggestion of raising revenue without raising taxes. I would like to see each counselor submit two lists to the town clerk, one list going through the budget, each, each council making six recommendations on what can be cut, and the other list, six ways that they can increase revenue in this town without increasing taxes. I'd like that on the clerk's desk by the next meeting of May 7th, and I'd like them posted outside so that when people come into the May 7th meeting, they can read them. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Anyone else? <coughs> My name is Michael Turek. I live in 11 Bayberry Lane in Scarborough. I happen to agree with that gentleman there. Uh, it's, I was under the impression that this council wanted a budget that would not increase taxes. And yet, I'm also under the impression that the council sends out to the different departments and says, bring us your budget. Well, if those departments know that you do not want an increase in taxes, why did you even accept the budget they proposed to you? Why didn't you just stop the process and say, no, you don't understand? Uh, Mr. Blaze and I have been exchanging emails about moving the process along. Well, part of the process is if they don't do what you say, stop it and send it back to them. You tell me you want no new pra uh, taxes, but yet you readily accepted a budget and moved it through the process instead of standing up and saying, no, I'm pushing back. I don't get it. <clears throat> Second thing is, I have to tell you, I can't afford another tax increase. In the time frame that this budget and my taxes have gone up by 30%. I'm retired. I'm on Social Security. My pay raises have been 4.1% cumulative, not 30%. It's time the council looks at what you really, really need and not what somebody wants. This is too far out of line. It wasn't long ago that one town here in Maine recalled their counselors. And if you pass this budget, I think it's time you all went too. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Nope. You go right up to the mic, sir. Come up here. Uh, Seth Fernald, 45 Maple Avenue. Uh, I don't know if it ties in the budget too much, but just one thing I really I was hoping, and I don't know where it is now, but just a push for natural gas a little wider spread, in Scar a little wider spread in Scarborough uh, to save. Uh, I know there's some, there's just, I think a run down 114. Just hoping that you know somehow in negotiations with the Unitil or whoever's uh, summit, I'm not sure who's in the area here of Scarborough because we don't have it in my area, a uh, pretty dense area, Maple Avenue. Uh, that would save a lot of people a lot of money, uh, a lot cleaner. I do not work for natural gas or anything, but I know it would be half the price of uh, of, of heating. Um, just wondering if somehow if we could just speak more with Unitil or the associated parties and just push for expansion in the Scarborough area to save uh, to save money. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Next. Uh, my name is Dick Springer. I live at, uh, in apartment J313 at Piper Shores. Uh, I don't like to pay taxes any more than anybody else, but Scarborough has the lowest mill rate in Cumberland County, and uh, at a certain point when you cut, you're not cutting fat, but you're cutting bone, and I suspect that we're at that point now. Uh, you can always increase class size in the school. You always pay teachers less and have fewer good teachers apply, and so on. Is that really what the residents of Scarborough want in order to... Uh, keep taxes, make taxes even lower than they are compared with everybody else? That's my question. I'm sure it's not a popular point of view. 
Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? <clears throat> Sam Summers, 267 Holmes Road. Um, on the topic of taxes, it's uh, the forefront of all of our minds, I'm sure, and obviously the issue that we have with the Plover situation adds on to the burden that people will be uh, faced with should certain resolutions go through un unchecked. One thing we want to not have added onto our tax bill next year because uh, we're protecting a handful of plovers on our beaches is the multiple dog parks that we're going to have to build to accommodate the thousands of dogs in this town and give them a place to run. So I am uh, very hopeful that uh, the compromises that have been placed in front of the council <coughs> with regard to changing the proposed ordinances uh, allow for uh, dog owners in this town to have some access to those beaches so we can avoid spending upwards of $50,000 uh, per dog park to uh, be outside with our dogs when we have that area for free currently. Uh, we also don't need things in our budget like plover coordinators and that kind of thing uh, adding on to our additional tax burden. So uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we can resolve that, get that out of the way so we can focus on the more important topics at hand like this tax burden that is faced uh, that we're all faced with because honestly that's more important in, in the end of the day so please get through the plover thing sensibly don't add on to our tax burden doing so and move on to more important business at hand thank you thank you anyone else general public comments anything Walter Rossnell, Magnolia Place. Uh, generally, don't speak out in public about things like this, but my tax bill went up $400 last year. It's looking like it's going up another $300 this year. That's $700 in two years is outrageously ridiculous. Uh, to, to the school budget to come back another $4 million is, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, you got what you wanted last year. Uh, we just can't afford. I'm retired. Uh, you know, there's a lot of senior citizens in this town, and you're driving us out of town here if you're not killing us off with these tax increases every year. It's getting out of hand. We may have the lowest mill rate, but you're trying to compete with Portland or Cape Elizabeth or these other places. It's not what you're here for. You're here to run Scarborough and not compete with the mill rates and whatever and whatever and Cape Elizabeth and Saco and all that shit and so forth. You've got to consider the senior citizens you have in this town. There are lots of senior citizens in this town, not just kids in school or people with dogs. If I had a dog, I'd keep the dog in my yard, as far as that goes. And I wouldn't spend thousands of dollars to keep somebody else's dog on the beach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Jolene Connor from 121 Ash Swamp Road. I have a little issue with the $400,000 worth of computers that you're planning on buying for the high school kids. I mean, really, how many of the kids in the town of Scarborough have, don't have computers? Please. I think that they can use their parents. They can use the libraries. This is ridiculous. The school budget is just running us terribly in debt. We can't afford it. You really need to take a look at this. As the other person had said, you got what you wanted last year. Let's take another look and see where you can cut and, and live within your budget. Many times you use the excuse that you're going to get matching money from the federal government. Well, I'm sorry, when they have shutdowns in the federal government, you can't guarantee you're going to get that money from the federal government. So start living within your means and stop taking it off the backs of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? If you'd like to speak, come right up to the mic. You don't have to put your hand up. <clears throat> yeah. If anybody else would like to speak, you can start a line right at the podium so we can move this along a little quicker. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Wally Fengler. I live on Holmes Road. I've been in this town since 1962. 
and I just did some figuring when I saw what the budget was going to be. And in the last four years, my taxes have gone up 18%. I retired in when I was 66, and two years later, I had to go back to work. I'm now 73, and I'm still working, trying to make ends meet. My uh, annuity, my annual uh, salary, has gone up 4% in those four years. So it's 1% a year. So when I take what I've, my increase and subtract it from what the town has increased my taxes, I have $440 for those four years. It's $110 a year to make do with everything else that's gone up. So I strongly encourage you to figure out ways to keep that budget in, ch in line and in check and not overspend. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay. With that, I'll close the public hearing. Next order. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is there any adjustments? Oh, wait a minute. Minutes. Minutes. I'm sorry. That's okay. <coughs> Minutes of the last meeting. Move we'll approval. Second. Second. Any or errors or omissions? No. Okay. All, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Is there any adjustments to the agenda? Items be signed, treasurer warrants. I'll sign those as the meeting goes on. Order number 1434 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and schedule a second reading on the proposed municipal school budget for fiscal year 2015. Okay, we have a presentation first, um, and then we'll open it up to the public hearing. I was having trouble with this TV monitor. Is that on now? <coughs> Very good. So I was asked just to provide a quick little presentation as a prelude to the uh, public hearing that will follow. Uh, this presentation tonight is largely based on a presentation I made about three weeks ago to the council when I proposed the budget, though it has been updated based on some of the, the work that's been done with uh, the various committees. The town council has a committee that has ongoing work on the budget, as does the school board. And so this presentation tonight does pick up some of those changes uh, there certainly are more to come. Uh, again, I can't stress enough how much this process is still ongoing and, uh, and evolving. Uh, nonetheless, I wanted to give you a, a snapshot of where we, where we sit this evening, uh, and, and perhaps you wish to comment on that after I'm done. So first, let's start off with the guidance. Uh, it's been suggested here from the podium. The council uh, did set a budget goal this year and this is the, the basic strategies uh, associated with meeting that goal, uh, those being conservative assumptions and kind of plan for the worst mentality, look at a comprehensive review of all fees and fines, flat spending, and uh, the result being a stable tax rate, advocate for Scarborough with the legislature, and a focus on capital budgeting. So those, uh, that goal was established sometime mid or late January, certainly before myself and my department heads were uh, finalizing our budgets, uh, and that was certainly, we were mindful of that through the process. Quickly, the process um, began with a presentation. The review process, as I mentioned, is ongoing. Uh, the Town Finance Committee has been meeting the last three Tuesday mornings for about two, two and a half hours, sometimes three, uh, working diligently through the budget. Um, our counterparts on the school side uh, have a similar process that's ongoing. I believe they have a meeting coming up on uh, April 28th and possibly on um, April 30th, excuse me, May 1st, May 1st. Um, so the final Finance Committee meeting will be this coming Tuesday, April 22nd, and I believe their expectation is to kind of wrap up their recommendations. And just so people further understand the process, the, the Finance Committee of the Town Council uh, typically, and I expect this year will be no different, will advance a number of recommendations to the full council. And typically the council will consider those as a first matter of business, if you will, uh, when the budget comes back up in final, a second and final reading. So to dig into some of the detail now, this, these uh, graphs just show kind of the distribution between the three major categories, that being town, school, and county. On the net basis, excuse me, let's start on the gross. Um, 
very quickly, this pie chart shows that 55% of the gross budget is education related, 42 is municipal, and 3% is county. And then when you shift to the net budget, and the difference here obviously is the town has the ability to raise non-property tax revenues of various sorts, whereas the school is very limited in that capacity. So not surprisingly, when you look at the share of the net budget, education rises to 65%, uh, municipality drops to 31%, and the county actually goes up to 4%. That just gives you a sense of where the tax dollar goes. Looking at the total budget, this is just gross expenditures on the municipal side. Uh, we're at this point at 4.9% increase in spending. On the education side, it's uh, right now it's seven, excuse me, 9.7, and that's a result of work that the finance committee and the school administration um, has has has. Uh, those are the results of that work, I should say. That number was 10.68 uh, um, upon my presentation of the budget. So there has been improvement, and again, I expect more to come. And then the county increase is 7.4 uh, percent. All told. That it calls for a 7.7 percent increase in gross expenditures. Quickly, uh, on the town side, I provide still fairly high level, but a little more detail as to where you know what's driving those numbers. So you see at the bottom, it shows the total increase of 4.9 percent, uh, just over 1.3 million dollars in additional spending, and you can see for yourself uh, across which categories those costs are being. Uh, are born, and there's certainly a, a lot of detail associated with each of those categories. Incidentally, all the town finance committee meetings are televised and certainly open to the public. Uh, that's a great opportunity if people want to know more about a particular department, that's where the detailed conversation occurs. Uh, beyond that, myself and my staff are certainly willing to provide further detail if people want to know. Some of the drivers on the expenditure side for the town, uh, I've just listed a handful here, but they do make up almost the entirety of that 1.3 million. Um, there are uh, a total of 12 different positions uh, proposed in my budget. I, I expect that those will continue to be scrutinized, and I honestly don't expect that all survive. Nonetheless, I thought it was important for the town council to have the opportunity to hear from my staff and myself uh, to understand the needs and to make uh, an informed decision as to whether uh, we can and we should go forward with some or all of these positions. Uh, again, I expect there will be some changes before this is all said and done. Uh, we've also done a pay plan uh, reclassification, and there's certainly contractual obligations that we have. We have contracted services, health insurance, and debt services going up. Again, those five categories make up almost the entirety of the town increase. Shifting to the school side, uh, these were the school budget objectives, and those are to develop a credible student center budget that does four things. Provides a realistic professional assessment of the, of the, of the level of student need in the district, maintains a continuous improvement focus, provides resources needed to achieve the second 18-month improvement plan, and builds upon the investments of prior uh, fiscal years. On the school side, a little more detail here. This shows, again, looking at the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see the 9.7 percent increase. Uh, that's the total percent increase for expenditures. And the school chose to break it up into four basic uh, categories, those being base expenditures. And I believe that's all kind of salaries and benefits. That's really the majority, as you see, uh, the vast majority of the school budget is wrapped up in that first category and something else called investments and restorations, <coughs> budget adjustments, and debt service. And certainly the superintendent is here tonight, as is his leadership team. Um, there is a lot more detail, of course, that uh, is associated with each of these categories. But for purposes of uh, for tonight, we wanted to be able to give you a little detail, but not overwhelm you at the same time. <coughs> the expenditure drivers on the school side, uh, just this short list uh, is about 1.2 million of that 3.8 million dollar increase. There are new, I guess, I believe, first first time expenses related to charter school tuition. There's outside services and tuition increases, utility and energy uh, cost increases, 
Is this further shift of some of the retirement expenses to the to the local level? Health insurance and debt service. And debt service is by far and away the single largest piece, at least on this column, uh, and almost uh, entirely associated with the new Wentworth School, uh, which was approved by the voters uh, quite overwhelmingly, I'd add. <coughs> Shifting to the revenue side, uh, this pie chart, chart just shows you the distribution of town revenues, not surprisingly, 70% of which um, come through property taxes. There are other smaller categories. Um, one of them I, I should note, and we'll go into some detail in a moment, is the state GPA. That's the state support for education a uh, trend that we've been struggling with for four or five years now is that number continually dropping year to year, and that's just exacerbated some of our budget challenges. Uh, the good news and the difference this year is that number's actually gone up slightly. Um, I won't stand here and, and suggest that that's going to continue because that does seem to be a real volatile number, but the good news is this year we're actually getting more. So just simply uh, between the town and the school, the town shows about a 7.4% increase in non-property tax revenues, and the school is showing just over a million dollars, which represents about a 20% increase. Uh, again, that's, a, that's a, the reversal of a trend that we have not seen for five years now. And combined, we're looking at about $1.8 million of new non-property tax revenue, or about 11.6%. Some of the detail of that, um, the increases on the school side, I mentioned earlier, there is more general purpose aid from the state coming uh, to the school district, uh, just over $600,000 in additional monies. There's also a proposal to use uh, $300,000 more in fund balance uh, for a total of $500,000 to assist in, in the efforts for next year. And revenues from all sorts of other smaller sources totaling about $112,000. And on the town side, uh, really a reflection, I believe, of the economy, we're actually projecting the increase in excise revenue, tax revenue. There's additional reimbursements, um, some from the school, and also where this budget contemplates contracted services with the town of Old Orchard Beach in providing dispatch services. And there's a revenue that comes back to us uh, associated with that contract. There's a number of proposed changes for permits and fees in the planning department. Public Works reimbursements, this account, uh, Public Works provides all of the vehicle maintenance services for the entire town fleet, all departments and the school, and they are compensated. Uh, the cost of those parts are going up, and so you see that um, as an additional revenue. Of course, we see that as an additional expense, too. And there's a kind of a new category, uh, recycling revenue, uh, that we're kind of excited about um, in the future. Forgive me for this being so detailed, but there is a capital improvement plan. Uh, we do do uh, annually a five-year capital plan. What you see before you and what the council is considering as part of this budget request uh, is uh, obviously next fiscal year, the first year of that five-year plan. And I've just uh, selected uh, a handful of items just to mention. So, for instance, under municipal capital projects, there are a number of technology upgrades. There's maintenance to fire stations. Uh, the Transportation Committee recommendations, predominantly those are improvements in the Oak Hill intersection area. A uh, number of road projects, and the library has requested uh, monies to do a, a, an expansion of the office area. Capital equipment, there is a programmed replacement for Engine 3, which is the, one of the pumpers. There's dispatch equipment, um, essentially to accommodate uh, bringing Old Orchard Beach, Beach on board two plow trucks, and the council is considering a town-wide revaluation as well. And on the school side, there's a, a number of technology projects. That's not just one. There's um, a great deal of detail behind that number. Uh, there's a lot of different facilities and maintenance-related uh, projects, and uh, there are three buses that are on the schedule for replacement as well. So that just gives you a flavor. There are more projects in that, but I've just kind of uh, picked out the larger ones, if you will, uh, for presentation. So what does that all mean? Um, the effect of this budget as it sits uh, 
today uh, calls for a, a total commitment of over $57 million, which represents a 6.31% increase in uh, monies to be raised through, through property tax. And that would require an 87, 87 cent increase um, on the tax rate. Now, for purposes of this calculation, we do assume some modest increase in value, total town value, and we've assumed $15 million increase. And that would essentially um, <coughs> reduce that number down to a 5.87% increase on the tax rate. Still uh, quite a bit of work to do, I would say. Um, and we further calculate that down, uh, the effect that would have on the average residential property taxpayer would be about an additional $261 a year in taxes. This chart, uh, again, forgive me, there's a lot of detail here, but um, I think it can be quite telling. This uh, shows you three critical factors, what's happened to the town valuation over the last 10 years, what's happened to the commitment, which is that the amount of money needed to be raised through property tax, and what the effect that has on the tax rate. And lastly, just uh, in terms of schedule from here forward, tonight, of course, is the public hearing. Um, on April 30th, there will be a joint budget workshop that the full town council and the full school board will meet in these chambers uh, to have a joint workshop. Uh, by then, uh, certainly the town finance committee will have completed its work, and I suspect the school finance committee will, will nearly be complete as well. That puts us in position for the council to consider the budget in final second and final reading on May 7th. And all of that points us toward the scheduled date for the school budget validation referendum vote on May 13. Um, town Hall serves as the polling place on that day, and that day is, is fixed at this point, so that's kind of the, the date that's driving this whole schedule, if you will. Um, and the results of the council's action on the 7th will determine what goes to the voters on that day. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that's a very quick and brief overview, uh, but I just wanted to kind of set the tone for the public hearing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll wait. <clears throat> Go right ahead. Okay, the <clears throat> schedule of the, for the second reading will be on May 7th. And anybody that will uh, open up the public hearing right now, anyone who would like to speak? A name and address. Who's going to be first? I'll be first. Public hearing on the municipal school budget for 2015. <clears throat> oh, she wants to tonight. <laughs> Maybe I should talk about the uh, Texas A&M and Mississippi playing playing basketball. Maybe I should talk about that. Anyway, uh, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I was born in 1930. And it happened that I'm sure my mom and dad are talking in the same situation as we hear this tonight. Uh, fortunately for me, my higher education came with a GI Bill. And I appreciate that from all you people who contributed to that. I think that probably if I went to school, my children were raised in four different states in New England. That My job, that was my responsibility, moving around with, with my job. I find that I believe in education. And my problem with raising the taxes is the value of my property is greater than it used to be. I have to pay for that value in the property. If what I pay for my condo is basically almost double today in 16 years. So therefore my taxes have to be also related to the same way. I hope that the council takes a, a real good look at this and hope the audience here understands that you gotta pay for education. I believe the first thing we have to do is make sure we can all read. Number one, read the budget, read the education. Have you ever visited the schools? Uh, I'm active with the seniors that I talked to you before. And we are planning to have some of our seniors who want to, to go to a classroom and look inside. And so what really, really happens in there. There's a lot of activity going on. Number one, I'm very concerned about technology. Boy, I grew up and worked for Mar Bell. We invented the transistor. I traveled the country and we were talking about this mighty midget. And without that thing, we would have had 
I'm sure radio tubes this big rather than little transistors this big. We have to look at this. We have to be very careful with it. We should really understand this. Go home and say, geez, you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay. But maybe they can knock off a couple of thousand dollars here and there or, or, or not fill a position. I get very upset when you take away languages. I get very concerned about that. I remember a few years ago when we had the students from other, from other schools come here and say, I can't go to school in Chicago anymore because you're not teaching Spanish. i got to go to someplace else. I shouldn't, that, that should never happen in Scarborough. And I think they probably take a good look. And I think uh, if the people understand exactly what we're doing with the money, that there should be no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone next? <clears throat> Public hearing on the municipal and school budget. Hi, my name is Larry Pelletier. I live on Horseshoe Drive. I have a couple of questions on the presentation that you just made. Um, the $604,000 extra revenue coming in this year, is that a one-year addition? Is that the total addition of extra money that we're receiving from the state of Maine? The format is really not for give and take of information. Right. I'm pleased to meet with you one on one. I can show you all that detail. Well, that's like. just a simple yes or no answer. There's no guarantees going forward, so I, I can't guarantee that beyond this year. No, I understand. I'm just asking: is that is that extra revenue, six hundred and four thousand extra, more than we expected this year, or is that that's what we are expecting this year? Extra revenue over the current year. Yeah. Thank you very much. My question is not about education. My question really has to, or not my question, my comment has to do with um, the budget reality. When I look at uh, CPI, Consumer Price Index, when I take a look at the rate of inflation for the last five years and compare it with what I see going on in our town um, and the way taxes are running, there's no correlation. Most everybody in this room probably um, has to make adjustments in their own family budget because they're not getting 10% raises, or if they are, I'm happy for them. But there probably aren't too many of us that get 10% a year. Um, and I would implore the council to look at the budgets, to remember that the people who live in town, for the most part, are probably not the recipients of 10-year, uh, I mean 10% increases and to try to find a way to be to come in with more realistic um, budgets so that this is not a contentious point, but the people can work together. Uh, we can't keep raising taxes every year 10%. It's not going to work. And for people to keep submitting budgets that invoke those types of uh, tax increases doesn't make a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, anyone else that would like to speak? You know, you can go up and line up at the podium. Move this along. Uh, I was. My name is Dick Springer, uh, apartment J313, Piper Shores. I was born in 1930, also, and uh, I general I endorse everything that uh, my fellow 1930 birth person said. Uh, I have a question. I don't know whether you have the answer. And that question is, how much are property taxes being, or property taxes, in, property tax increases being driven by reductions in state aid for uh, schools? I don't know whether you can give an answer, but I certainly put the question out there because I think it's probably pretty significant. Thank you. Um, any, if anybody has <clears throat> questions on the budget, they can contact um, the town manager mm -hmm. um, anytime. Um, during these um, public hearings, we just want to hear comments from the general public, and because uh, it's really not a format to be answering questions back and forth. Town manager's in his office every day, pretty much, to uh, and can get back to you if you leave a message. Anyone else? Anyone else like to comment on the municipal school budget? Seeing none, I'll close the hearing. Order number, order. Order number 14.
35 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and schedule a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 6 of the <coughs> Animal Control Ordinance. Okay, anyone from the public like to comment? Please step forward, name and address. This is the night, public hearing. The second reading will be May 7th. Going once. Are you on? I can't hear. Oh, thought I was speaking loud enough. Uh, it's a public hearing. The Animal Control Ordinance. If anyone would like to speak, you can line up right behind the podium. Name and address, please. Uh, Elaine Richer, 5 Reef Lane, 28 East Grand Avenue. Um, a counselor has mentioned a couple of times that the ordinance is something that she can live with, even though it's not something that she would like. We might also, we might have something in common, because that counselor and I don't have a dog. And at the end of the day, neither of us has to face the reality of this ordinance. I got involved in the beginning because the process was more than flawed. It was outright unbelievable. I believe that when the council heard the arguments for keeping the ordinance as it was and work on the education enforcement, common sense would rule. I then believe that when the referendum was passed, it was at least a time for the council to, be, to reflect and work on a compromise. Then my belief system broke down. So now positions are justified by invoking phrases to put people into factions. First, we have the silent majority. These are people who are not politically vocal, they are not outspoken, they are not active, and we have no idea how they feel about any issue. But this phrase is often used by politicians when the vocal minority disagree with their opinions. You can say, I represent the silent majority, and I'm sure the silent majority is against it, or I'm sure the silent majority is for it. We have no idea. Then we have the phrase, special interest groups, which of course has a negative connotation. In today's vernacular, it means a group who have a lot of money to sway politicians to do their bidding. We have special interest groups on both sides. We have special interest groups that champion some political cause because they truly care. With so much apathy in this country, when a group is willing to give of their time and energy, we should applaud their endeavor and not put them down. We will never know whether the group of people who oppose the ordinance are a special interest group or part of a larger silent majority, but whatever you want to call the group, they deserve respect. Respect that was never accorded after the referendum. Respect that was never accorded in the selection of the ad hoc committee. The council speaks of a compromise that you have skillfully participated in. You compromise with a select committee in which the majority of the members were selected to agree with you. That's not a compromise. A compromise occurs with groups that are not on the same page with one another. If that had happened, we would have seen a settlement with mutual concessions that were agreeable to the parties. That's a true compromise. Then some of us wouldn't necessarily have loved it, but we could have lived with it. There's still time to change the terms of this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next. Hello. My name is Julie Hannon, Mass Road. Um, I've written to all of you several times. I've written to members of the public several times, to members of the media. Uh, this for me is not about dogs. This for me is not about plovers. I think we should protect the plover. I think we should allow dogs to walk on the beach, off leash. But it's not about that for me. For several years, I taught grade six social studies. In grade six social studies, you learn about the Constitution. And one of the founding... Uh, Features of the Constitution is the separation of the federal government and the state. We all know that. This is what it's about for me. It's about the separation of the federal government and the state rights. 
and I believe that we are acquiescing. We are giving up our state rights to the federal government. If indeed we should be restricting our dogs on our beaches, then the federal government should be respecting the laws that are guiding them, that are meant to guide them. They haven't done that. I do not believe that our town has received due process. I don't believe that. I don't believe we've seen evidence. It's my understanding that the plover was destroyed. Where is that? Where is the evidence? Where have you shown this town the evidence that says that there was a plover take? Has the U.S. Fish and Wildlife follows, followed the guidelines and the laws that they should be following? Have they consulted with the people that live on the land before they've changed and influenced laws that affect those people? I don't think they have. This became a real issue for me when we decided to negotiate with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife before we asked them to show us the evidence to prove to us that we were responsible for this. We weren't giving, given our day. We weren't given the evidence. We weren't given the opportunity to negate that evidence. We did our best as a public. Every time you talk about the dogs, overwhelmingly the people that are speaking at this podium are people that are questioning the process I don't believe that they're all, pro they're all questioning the ordinance. They are questioning the process. They are questioning their rights. And they're questioning whether or not their rights are being violated. I'll tell you something. If I was a beachfront owner, I would be in court right now. I would have a lawyer at my side. And I would not allow this to be happening. This is not right and it is not fair. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Liam Summers, uh, Holmes Road. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, Mr. Benedict, Mrs. Katerina, Mrs. St. Clair for responding to my recent email to the council. <clears throat> While we may not agree, it is encouraging that we can have a discourse at least, and I appreciate that. Uh, with regard to this situation, uh, with the animal control ordinance. Uh, what I was attempting to do in that letter, uh, I will do again this evening. You are close to a resolution on this if you can get past certain hurdles. And those hurdles are to not go with the overly restrictive uh, Fish and Wildlife or Maine Audubon recommendations that are really not founded in any basis of fact about the impact of dogs on the beach. What I encourage you to do is actually read about the, the truth about the uh, plover populations on our beaches and in Maine in general. Uh, they don't mesh with what Audubon would like you to believe them to be by their own data. So if you read their data, you'll see that we had the most productive plover season last year in I think it was nine or 10 years. So it's not quite uh, the, the dire straits that uh, Audubon would like us to believe. Nonetheless, uh, I agree with Ms. Hannon uh, and the other speakers here, no one's trying to eradicate plovers on the beaches. This, this is honestly, yeah, I'm as tired of talking about this as you are about hearing me talk about this. I can't imagine that every Wednesday you wake up going, great, today's the day I get to hear Liam again. No one wants that, truthfully. Uh, it's foolishness that we've gone this far. It really is. It's, it's mind-boggling. I was thinking about on the drive here, like, I, am I really going to get up there and prattle on my soapbox again? <laughs> I, I, I do it because it's, 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 it's foolishness. We have to stop this. We have to stop it. Common sense, rational thought, a little reason, a little reach across the table and say, look, you want this, you want this, right in the middle is here. We're not there yet. We're close. We have to get past a few of these hurdles that are preventing us from it. Nobody wants another recall. No one wants another uh, whatever, referendum. We're spending money that we don't have. Obviously, we're talking about taxes here, and here we are spending money on foolishness. We don't have it to spend. So let's stop it. Just settle this thing once and for all. Get rid of the things that you know are going to cause contention. Put in place what you think are reasonable guidelines, which we would all agree on, and let's move forward for once and for all so I can stop talking to you about this stuff. And then I can talk to you about taxes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Seth Fernald, uh, Maple Avenue, and I'll try and keep it short too. I just don't want you, uh, my abs you know, the absence of speaking to things. <laughs> the the thought's not there anymore. Uh, the one plover I've taken in 30 years. Uh, most people in the dog group, they're animal people. They love animals. They love plovers. Love animals. Just trying to have you know a nice, nice accord with uh, the whole situation. Um, I think the uh, the ordinance, as it's been kind of going past back and forth, is you know getting closer. I think the roaming plover situation, which would be governed probably with a lot of influence from the Audubon and IFW, I think that's a big situation. We probably most people who have dogs uh, would not agree want to agree with. That's the same IFW who's kind of was letting houses fall in and in Saco until the town council had to jump in and say, hey, these houses are falling into the water, we should probably stop this. The IFW and Audubon by themselves had no no reason to want to stop that or help. Um, the uh, the winter hours, 11 to 2, that's a tough time, only time that's really warm for people to walk in the winter when that winter is 95% people with dogs. There's no reason anybody in the right mind should be on the beach in January unless you have a dog and want to get some exercise. Uh, again, with uh, as far as imposing the restrictions on private property, especially um, uh, down at Pine Point, I do fear that if we tell people what so they can do with their private land, we're going to have the same feedback as Kennebunk had. People are going to post their land, and we push them too far, they're going to push right back, and we're going to have a huge issue there. That's something, I, as someone who enjoys the beach, I would not want to be kicked off other people's property after being able to enjoy their private property for so long. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Rob McLaughlin, 29 Vesper Street. I had no intentions of speaking, but Julie got me all fired up. Um, because, I, you know, to be honest with you, I'm fearful 10 years from now we're not going to be able to walk on half of our Scarborough beaches because they'll be protected. I truly think that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife has way too much power. I would like to see the town of Scarborough stand up to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, because, you know, I question, I look at that dredge and I think, did it stop because of plovers? I mean, did we really stop the dredge when our fishermen re who rely on fishing as a livelihood were maimed? And did that did it have anything? I just it blows my mind. I try not to think it might not be because of um, the plovers, but I, it, it bothers me, and I just think that I'm fearful. Um, I'm fearful for losing our rights, and I really wish you'd stick up to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And as far as the ordinance, I can't believe it's been over eight months. I mean, if all this energy was put to something that was, you know, it would have been nice. But um. My one comment on the winter hours, to me, it's an example of total intolerance of people's differences. I live at Higgins. I'm there every single day. And for the most part in the winter, I'm the only one on the beach. You might see a handful. And for the few people, and if I see someone that doesn't have a dog, I put my dog on leash. And I just think, what are you going to do in January when I'm down by the river and my dog is off leash and I'm the only one there? I mean, you're going to really send a policeman off over to give me a ticket? You know, and I go back to the... I go back to enforcement. If you had someone sitting at the end of Higgins at 5 o'clock and dubbed a lot of people's deputies just to give people tickets for having their dog off leash, you'd make a fortune. I mean, I can't tell you what happens during the day because I don't go there during the day, but we, we're not effective, and I think we can make little changes by really enforcing what we have. I'll give people tickets, but you can't do it now because you go and try to enforce the ordinance now, and you get that, that person's off a leash, that person's not on a leash, you can't tell me what to do, and I've given up, because I respect the ordinance that we have today. I would never let my dog off of a leash after five. Quite frankly, I think five's a little too early, because no one obeys the rules. So, please, I, you know, to me, the winter, it's, a, it's, let's try to respect each other's differences. Higgins is a huge beach, I'll stay away from people. Um, so anyways, that's all I have to say, and I think Julie has a really good point, and I hope you think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Lathrop. I live at 30 Robinson Road in Scarborough, 
And I'd just like to address the, this one part of the ordinance that's changed um, under 6410C um, where it says that from the day after um, Labor Day to May 14th, um, the dogs, they can be on the leash or on the beach except um, they need to be on leash from uh, 11 to 2. Um, I'm wondering why, because it used to be September 15th where dogs needed to be on, on leash, um, or at least not, they needed to not be on the beach from 9 to 5 up until September 15th, and then they were allowed on the beach after 5 but on leash. Um, those first two weeks of September to me are prime times where people like to go to the beach. People <coughs> come here. Uh, retired people come for holidays, people with small children, that's that Labor Day week is the weather's still nice um, and people want to be on the beach and they're used to being on the beaches here without any dogs. And so I'd like to suggest that we change that date back to September 15th rather than having the shift <coughs> happen the day after Labor Day and having <coughs> these dogs on the beach when there's senior citizens um, and people with small children on vacation trying to enjoy the very last um, warmth of the summer season. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, Peter Hayes from uh, Union Hill Lane. Just kind of like to echo, and I think this is what's kind of happening here is kind of a microcosm of what's happening across our country. And we look at, all you have to do is look out west of the Bundy situation. There have been a lot of federal agencies that are really trying to flex and, and try to influence things. And if you look at what happened out there, you know, you have the Bureau of, La Bureau of Land sending in SWAT helicopters, sniper teams all over a rancher and grazing. So I think, you know, let's, you know, you look at SACO. They actually, as a community, pushed back against what was happening there and they created change. And I think we as a community, this is important to all of us. We need to have some courage. We have to do what's right for the majority of the citizens here and not be intimidated by some of these federal agencies that are really trying to, if you look at the IRS with what's happened to the IRS scandal, if you look at the Department of Labor and the Bundy situation I just mentioned, you look at a bunch of these things. It's time that we push back, and as so eloquently said earlier, this is an issue of there's a role for federal government. There's also a role for local government, which is what we are. And yet the, the citizens of, of Scarborough have spoken. They clearly have said what they'd like to have done with the leash law. So please listen to the citizens here. You are to represent us. So I hope, I hope you consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Anyone else? Because I'm going to close the hearing. Okay. Order number 14-36 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and, and a schedule a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 604A, the Horse Beach Permit Ordinance. Okay, um, the schedule for the um, uh, for the second reading will be on May 7th. Again, with this one, and is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on the Horse Beach Permit Ordinance? Horses on the beach. Anyone like to speak to that? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close the hearing. Order number 14-37 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and schedule a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 610, the Piping Clover Ordinance. Okay, once again, the second uh, reading will be held on May 7th. And do I have anybody from the public that would like to speak on the Piping Clover Ordinance? Anyone? This is your opportunity. I'll say very simply, the fact that we even have a plover ordinance to me is ridiculous. You know, what are we going to have next? We're going to have a bluebird one. We're going to have an American eagle ordinance. We're going to have a snowy owl ordinance. I mean, the fact that our town has one. I get why the U.S. Fish and Wildlife protects them. I get why they're taken care of by the U.S. government. What I don't get is why we have put ourselves in a position where we are responsible for protecting the animals in a way that we are a vehicle for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I struggle so much with this. 
this balance that we have in our government, the fact that the U.S. government now knows better than the citizens, and in many cases they don't know better. We are the U.S. government. We are. Everybody in this room, we are the U.S. government, we are the state government, we are the local government, we are the council. So we know just as well as someone who is sitting in Washington and is saying, oh, let's get the town of Scarborough to protect them. We'll put these things in place. They're holding us hostage, folks. They're doing it with education. Education is a state right. I'm an educator. We are, first we put an idea. It's not that I don't, I disagree with what they're asking us to do. What I disagree with is that they are holding our funds hostage. They are holding our contracts hostage. That's what they're doing. That's what we are doing to ourselves because we are allowing it to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julie Hannon, Mastro. I'm Ellie Springer. I live at 15 Piper Road. Um, what I don't get is why it's okay to disobey the regulations. These are federal regulations. They're there for a reason. I believe a very good reason. And why it's okay for us to disregard them. And it's okay for other people to do to 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 follow the law, but we don't have to. That's what I don't get. So I. I believe in our government. I believe in following its regulations, and I don't see how we can justify all this stuff that's going on here. It seems so muddy to me. All this, but the the bottom line for me is this is the law. I brought my kids up to respect the law, and I would hope that we would do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Liam Summers, uh, Holmes Road. I wasn't going to speak again, but, I, but we don't usually get this many people here at these meetings, so this is less about addressing you and more about addressing uh, the town. I just I don't know that people are. Excuse are, me. Yes. You have to address your comments. I will. I will. So I just, not the to, just thank you. Just understand why I'm coming up again because I wasn't planning on. Uh, I just maybe the, I'll address this to the council, yes, please. As as regard to piping plovers, the facts remain, indisputable facts remain, that in our on our beaches, on the beaches that we're talking about, there in 2012 were exactly six birds, six birds. The amount of money that this town is now going to spend to protect those six birds, we would be able to buy the computers for the kids in the schools. Uh, so I just am curious why it is when piping plovers don't even select our beaches as primary nesting habitat in Maine, the, the beaches in Kennebunk are their primary nesting habitat. The beaches in southern Maine are beaches. They don't even care to, to nest here, typically. Six, six birds, six is what we're talking about. So if we spend money on a piping plover coordinator, if we spend all the money on the literature and the new website to let people know when they can and can't be on the beach and put in place uh, new tagging programs and we hire another animal control officer to get down there and write some tickets, what we're talking about is probably, what, a couple hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars to get all of this done every single year for six birds. So each one of those birds is going to have an annuity of about 40 grand at the end of the day, right? I, I have a son in school. There's no ordinance to protect his rights in school. Give him the 40 grand. Uh, you know, I, I would, I, I, we just have to have some common sense here. Someone has to take a, a step back and say, what are we talking about? This is, there's not a wholesale slaughter of birds on the beaches every year. You know, this is one plover was assumedly killed by a dog in the last 10 years, a single plover. Do you know that the banding project that Maine Audubon did on the plovers in 2010 killed 126 of them? 
But one plumber is a catastrophe that the town now has to pick up a tab of two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars to protect these six birds. This is insanity. Stop. Think what you're doing. The money doesn't need to be spent on the plovers. The ordinance doesn't need to be radically altered to protect plovers. Plovers are just fine on these beaches before, and they're just going to be just fine on the beaches after. They don't care what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, the Endangered Species Law was created in the 1970s, and it um, is not a law that protects every single endangered species. What it does is it requires that the agencies of the government set, create recovery plans for every species. And it requires that, as part of those recovery plans, they set guidelines. They're not laws, as someone previously said. These are not laws. These are guidelines. We had Mark McCullough from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service come up here and tell us it is not the law. So we are not breaking the law. The breaking of the law comes from when you take an individual of a species. But when projects take endangered species, development takes endangered species, um, shoreline protection of golf courses takes a species, all kinds of things take a species, and that is against the law. As Mr. Summers has explained, there has been no data, except for one in 30 years, about dogs taking a plover, and even that we don't have yet. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was clear that the endangered species law is not the law that creates, that requires leashes on dogs or dogs to be removed from leashes at all. The intention of the Endangered Species Act was to protect the entire species, not the individual. And it's gone, um, because it was created in the 70s and things have changed so much, um, the intent, is, it really needs to, to be overhauled, frankly, and we see that all over the country. So. Um, I think with good intent, the town has put this plover protection ordinance in effect, and I think the 200-foot uh, distance is a good improvement. I think that's good that the town is willing to take those steps to do it. But I, I also do agree that we are doing, we are already going above and beyond, and we spent $5 million on protecting conservation land, and that's also going above and beyond every single town in this state. We have spent more money on conservation, protecting the marshes, protecting wildlife habitat, than any other community in the state, our tax dollars. And I think the U.S. Fish should pay attention to that as well, because that's part of the whole protection packet. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm Dick Springer. I live at uh, Piper Shores, apartment J313. I'm back. Uh, it seems to me that there have been some seriously over-the-top attacks on the federal government as infringing on our supposed constitutional rights. Now, what localities do and what states do affect people outside the state frequently. And, uh, uh, for example, uh, do the people in Ohio have the right to burn as much coal as they want to generate their power when it uh, uh, kills trees in upstate New York and Maine? I don't think so. And who's going to regulate that kind of thing? And the assertion that it's our right and we don't have to follow guidelines by the EPA and other federal agencies, uh, it seems to me, is in the long run really destructive of what we all have to do. I, I mean, there has to be cooperation among communities and among states, and the federal government has to regulate things. And somebody mentioned the Bundy situation in Nevada. That guy owes the federal government a million dollars, and he got a bunch of armed goons to uh, keep the feds from collecting it. And I don't see how that's in any way relevant to the issues we were talking about here. Thank you. Pamela Rovner, 4 King Street, Pine Point. First of all, happy Easter to everyone. Secondly, when you talk about following the law, 
each of the counselors who are sitting here tonight are sitting here because they received the most votes from the citizens. We received the most votes from the citizens in the dogs group, and yet here we are still fighting for what we won, and that's being completely ignored. Nobody cares about the fact that when you have a vote, whoever gets the most votes wins. But that seems to be lost when it comes to the dogs. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to the piping plover ordinance? Anyone? Okay, closing the public hearing. Order number 14-40 is a 7 p.m. public hearing in action on the new request for a massage therapist license from Nancy Whitehouse working at U.S. Health Works located at 55 Spring Street. Okay, open the public hearing on the license for a massage therapist. Anyone like to comment? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Discussion? Anyone? No. Mm -hmm. um, Casey? Just say welcome to Scarview. Okay. Thanks yeah. for opening a business. Thank you. Call in order. Okay. Seeing <clears throat> uh, no one has any further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolution 14-05 is act on the request to proclaim the week of April 13th as National Library Week in Scarborough. Kate, um, Kate were you going to read that? Yes. Ready? Please do so. Uh, be it resolved by the Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, in Town Council assembled that and whereas libraries help lives change in their communities, campuses, and schools, and whereas librarians work to meet the changing needs of their communities, including providing resources for everyone and bringing services outside of library walls, and whereas libraries and librarians bring together community members to enrich and shape the community and address local issues, and whereas librarians are trained, tech-savvy professionals providing technology training and access to downloadable content like e-books. And whereas, libraries offer programs to meet community needs, providing residents, students, and businesses with classes, service, and workshops. And whereas, libraries continuously grow and evolve in how they provide for the needs of every member of their communities. And whereas, libraries, librarians, library workers, and supporters across America are celebrating National Library Week. Now therefore, be it resolved by the town council in town council assembled as follows that the Scarborough Town Council proclaims Library Week in Scarborough April 13th to 19th, 2014, and further encourages all residents to visit the public or school library this week to take advantage of the wonderful library resources available. Thank you, Councilor Sinclair. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? Comments? Council? Oh, we've got a great library, and uh, I, I think it should be applauded. And uh, I enjoy it practically every day. I would, I'd just say that knowing um, the library as I do, uh, I would guess that that week they're going to have a lot of things going on, so I'm sure they'll publicize that. Um, it's a great opportunity to introduce your kids if you haven't taken them. Um, so many resources there. So... Thanks. And with that being said, all those in favor? Oh, yeah. Opposed? Seeing none. Under new business, and uh, number, uh, order number 1441 <coughs> is asked to set the date, time, and location of the school budget val validation referendum for Tuesday, May 13th, 2014. Polls would open up at 7 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. And it's going to be located right here at Town Hall. So I have a motion. Oh, approval. Second. Uh, Discussion? Anybody? I would just say um, to remind folks at home, it's always significantly important that you vote. And um, certainly, typically, we've always had that secondary question, you know, too high, too low. So again, um, the importance of filling out that second little bubble in your ballot, um, it certainly helps us have a better sense of direction. 
So, again, don't forget to vote. Thank you for that. Councilor Caterina. Um, I would direct this question to the town clerk. There's absentee voting will be available, I assume, prior yes. to this, and when would that start? It actually starts a week before. It would be April 30th. So people, if you can't make it uh, on the 13th, you can get a ballot beforehand and vote. So just a reminder of that. Okay, non-action items. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Oh, did you, I'm sorry, Jim. I looked that way once. Did you have, go ahead. Yes, I did. With the uh, disapproval of an awful lot of people, at this point, I don't see the need for Tuesday, May 13th. That's less than a month from now. And as we've indicated, we're not even close on what, what the uh, budget is going to do. And I don't believe especially after hearing the school committee, uh, school budget, whatever, isn't <coughs> meeting till the 28th or 29th of this month. It's putting an awful short window and doing an awful lot of work. Right, Al, that's state law. We're following the state law, and <clears throat> we've been, I've been in contact with our representatives on that issue of the way the budget you know, with their decisions, with our decisions, and the windows that they allow should be looked at to be changed. So we'll see how that goes. Am I correct? And that's state law, right? Uh, yes. yes. <clears throat> well, there's, there's a number of state laws that are relevant, uh, perhaps more to Councillor Benedict's point. Uh, the reason we schedule it so early, you might say, you might ask, uh, early May is to allow enough time on the back end should there need to be multiple additional votes, and in fact, last year, three validation votes were required. Uh, it is a requirement by charter in state law to approve a budget by the end of June, and so it's really a function of that calendar and leaving enough time on the back end should there need uh, be a need to go back to the voters. Okay. Council Blaze? Um, Tody, did you say that absentee ballots would be available on a April 30th? Yes. Well, I have, I, to have I, them, I have to have them available seven days prior to the final vote taken, which right. would be May 7th. We don't have a budget by then. That's correct. And what happens is people are issued the ballot. However, they cannot return it back to me until after the budget's passed. Okay. Another quirk of the state law in yes. the time. That's a good answer, though. Also, St. Clair? No, I don't. I just had one question. I don't know if Tom's going to be able to answer this or if somebody would be willing to answer it from the school. Um, that sixth line item that talks about the substantial, obviously, it's, and it makes sense, um, salaries, contracts, I'm assuming that's fixed. Those are negotiated contracts that are, I, I would assume, that carry on further than this. I mean, there's no wiggle room there at all. <coughs> I personally don't have enough knowledge of what's included in their so-called base expenditures, but I, I suspect the vast majority of uh, the items in that category are, in fact, contractually obligated. Uh, you might say that they're, they are fixed. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Back this way. Mm -mm. All right. I got everybody this time. All right. Good. <coughs> All those in favor? Against? All right. The vote. Non-action items. Okay. Standing and special committee reports. I uh, will start with Council Sinclair. I am. <coughs> oh, we had ordinance meeting today, which mm -hmm. is really productive. Um, and rather interesting. Mm. Um, we are going over, um, I know there's some concern down at Pine Point with their parking. We're working on that. Um, we've gotten a couple emails about that. We're also talking uh, about medical marijuana and how we write ordinances for that. Um, and 
the one item you did move on was the change to the local mm -hmm. property tax right. um, rebate program. Right. So we did pass that along, which was excellent. Um, and you can, those are televised. So you can actually go back and watch those if you have questions, and then feel free to ask any of us any questions about those. Um, and I think that's it. The li obviously, the library week um, is big, and that's it for me. Council Blaze. Um, yesterday, we had a senior advisory board meeting. Uh, primarily, the work uh, that was done at the meeting was all organizational and planning work for the uh, upcoming senior expo. <coughs> and uh, as Tom mentioned before in his report, the uh, Finance Committee has been meeting on a weekly basis discussing individual department budgets, and that will be continuing. That's it. Councilor Benedict. Um, the only committee that I'm on that had, had a meeting was, I believe, Scarborough Shellfish. Um, all the licenses were renewed. Um, <coughs> no crabbing from May 1st to June 15th, and the rest of it was just miscellaneous in the housekeeping, but it was a profitable meeting. Well, I have. Thank you. Councilor Katarina. Uh, yes, uh, long range planning met on April 4th and we discussed some uh, potential changes down the line to some zoning in Pine Point and Higgins Beach so people don't have to go through the Zoning Board of Appeals every time they want to do anything to their house. Also some rezoning um, next to my house actually <laughs> on Gorham Road. Um, we met with the neighbors. Uh, the abutters to the Gorham Road redistricting proposal on April 9th. About 15 people turned out, which is a good turnout. And our next meeting is Friday, May 2nd. We meet bright and early, Friday mornings at 8 a.m. And I'm like, oh boy. But anyway, that's when we meet. Also, Conservation Commission met this week. Um, we're looking at sea level rise projects, uh, the latent farms development, got a report, follow-up report on uh, from the planning board and a uh, discussion of the Benjamin Farm uh, project that's um, under contract right now and the uh, commission will be sending a letter to us on the town council asking for our support. And that's it for me. <coughs> Councilor Donovan. The finance committee met as we have uh, every week uh, for the month of April. Uh, and had a very good exchange this week with the uh, school board uh, members, finance committee, and uh, the superintendent. Uh, uh, I think we're getting to better understand what is going on with their budget, and it's going to be a lot of work for us to reach this, but we'll spend the better part of the rest of the month and into May doing an analysis to try to fully understand exactly what we have. Okay, thank you. Councilor Holbrook. Um, Housing Alliance will be meeting tomorrow, April 7th at 6.30. Um, they will be having a goal setting as well as um, an election for chair for that, for that committee. Um, like my fellow councilors mentioned, um, Finance Committee met on Tuesday, April 15th. We had a presentation from the superintendent as well as the um, Board of Education chair and the chair of their Finance Committee. Um, they did give us a current state of the school budget, if you will, um, so that's still a work in progress and, and things to come. Um, we also met with MIS, um, which is our technology department. Um, they do have a few CIP projects that will be coming forward in request. Um, most of this has to revolve around end of life. Um, we have some equipment and some hardware, and we can no longer get parts and pieces, and it's starting to break down. So some of that is um, end of life replacements as well as um, an emergency backup system was also within that CIP request. 
Um, this would allow for, in the event of an emergency, if things went down, we would still have a means to retrieve information like who's paid what taxes, what payroll needs to go out, the, the, all those backup data things. Um, as well on their request, they did have a joint shared position with the school. Um, and then we also had community services. Um, their overall bottom line was almost flat. That There are changes within that budget, but from one department to the other department, and by the time you get to the bottom line overall, they were relatively flat. Um, they do have a shared position um, within that budget with public works. That's for a part-time person to handle some beach issues for community service in the summer. And then for public works, that would address overtime and plow routes and problems they're having being able to maintain some of the roads. So again, that would be a joint position between the two departments. Um, the other few suggestions that they had is they are suggesting, um, as was one of our counselor goals, they looked at some of their user fees. Um, community services has reached pretty much an all-time high at being self-funding, um, but in order to maintain that, they're at the 80, I think it was 86% threshold, um, which is the highest they've ever been. Um, they will need to adjust a few fees in order to kind of keep on track with that. Mostly it revolves around, again, these are all user-based systems, so child care services, beach permits, things like that. The folks that use those services therefore pay for it rather than asking for us for um, an increase to their budget. Um, <coughs> the next meeting for Finance Committee will be April 22nd at 9 a.m. Um, that time we will have um, the last two pieces for, for us on the municipal side, that'll be administration and also outside agency <coughs> requests. And then we will be going through um, each department and making suggestions for the manager to collect and submit as our collective recommendation to the second reading for council on the municipal side. Um, we do have a joint workshop with the um, council and school board that is April 30th, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. I wrote it down somewhere. Um, and that'll be at 7 p.m. Um, appointments met this evening. Um, they do have um, a name to post. It will be Michael Bunting for the Housing Alliance. And that's it. Okay. Um, I have nothing to report on committees. Um, so we'll go right to the uh, town manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple quick words. Um, <coughs> we've assisted the uh, Army Corps of Engineers as they're looking to wrap up the dredge project. As I've reported in the past, the project is not done, but they do need to kind of clean things up uh, to get through the <coughs> summer season. The contractor has, has removed his equipment from the site, though there's still some work to do to kind of shape some of the, the dredge spoils that were deposited on Western Beach. And so they're looking to source some local contractors to assist with that effort. So we've helped there, and we're, I'll certainly continue to work with them and track um, the project with all intent to get them back here next fall when the next opportunity presents itself. Uh, another matter I'd just like to mention in passing, and uh, it's going to come back through the committee process and ultimately to you, I suspect, but for a number of years we've been dealing with complaints from residents regarding train whistles and uh, disturbances associated with that. There's two, two crossings in particular that we've received a number of complaints on, and, and staff has actually spent a little time understanding how the federal quiet zone rules work. Um, the town of Freeport uh, is right now completing a similar process. I believe they have 10 different crossings in Freeport that they, uh, that uh, trains no longer whistle at. Um, we're going to send this through the uh, Transportation Committee, or who I think is ideally suited to take these matters up. Uh, the two areas are at Winners Neck, Winners Neck Road. Uh, it, at the point where the crossing is, there's only a few properties, but there's certainly a lot of folks that live within earshot of that intersection. And then a private crossing called the Nelson Crossing. It's off Highland Avenue, and it would access what formerly was Dragon Cement, had a plant, if you will, on the other side of the tracks. Uh, the train whistles consistently at that location, though there's no traffic. So I, 
I think this will be a good thing. It's not an easy effort by any stretch, but I'm sure the uh, Transportation Committee will be interested in taking it up, and I hope to advance it quickly. Also, a couple of quick uh, just little mentions. There's a free electronics recycling day. This is a project jointly sponsored by Time Warner Campbell and USM, and it's at the Portland Woodbury campus on April 12th, 9 to 1. And I, I mention that just because I participated in one just a year ago, and I assure you if you look around your house and in your closet and in your basement, we all have old, dead electronic equipment. And please take the time. It's a free event uh, to dispose of that, those products uh, properly. Again, it's April 12th, 9 to 1. I beg your pardon. I'll have to get back. I think I, missed, I put that date down wrong. I beg your pardon. Um, well, if there's a one in the future, I encourage you to do it. <laughs> 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 it's a great program. <laughs> this is a footnote. I was amazed. I filled my car twice. Yeah. Uh, you'll be amazed how much stuff you have hidden in your house. Yeah. And uh, finally, just for the Council's benefit, um, the annual Scarborough Community Chamber Municipal Officials Dinner, Appreciation Dinner, is May 20th. That's a Tuesday evening, and this year will be at Piper Shores. They are looking for you to respond if you can make it. And if you didn't get the invitation, I can certainly provide one to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor, <coughs> Councillor comments. I'll start with uh, Council Sinclair. I'm good. Thank you. Council Blaze. Well, I'd just like to thank uh, everybody that stood up and talked about the budget. Uh, whether you thought it was too high or too low, the important thing is you stood up and you talked about it. Um, I specifically want to thank the person that did stand up and talk about the CPI because that is it's really a key for a lot of people in this town. We are the oldest town in the state, and the state is the oldest town in the nation. We have a lot of retired people, and when the taxes go up, the past four years, the taxes went up 21%, and this budget is proposing it to go, for the last five years, pretty close to 30%. Well, if you take a look at the CPI, the CPI has only gone up about it eight, maybe nine percent. And people, the CPI is more uh, a measure of people that are working and making an income. Uh, retired people, maybe they have retirements and they have Social Security, but they don't get increases very often. Uh, so increases like this to their taxes is, is an indication that people are being driven out of town. Um, and we've got to do something to prevent that from happening. We can't have people leaving this town just because the taxes are going too high. Thank you. Councilor Benedict. Oh, I just echo what Councilor Blaze said. To give you an honest to God idea, my Social Security increase this year was $35. That doesn't come close to my taxes going up 260. And it can only go on so long, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the boat. So we have some more work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Katarina. Yes. Um, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the school and the school budget. Um, I support the best schools that Scarborough can afford, and I want people to be very clear about that. Uh, the original intent of the property tax way, way back when was to fund uh, free public education. Uh, and so as such, it deserves attention uh, to ensure the success of our students, because after all, they are our future. Uh, however, in this time of the major cost shifts that have occurred uh, from the state onto municipalities and schools, uh, we have a large number of unfunded band-aids, for example, that have come down uh, that I'm hoping that the school department, I asked them at the finance meeting it to see if they can tease out a percentage so I can get a better idea of how much of that is unfunded that we're looking at. But uh, we really need to examine uh, any portions of the budget that don't contribute directly uh, to the success of students in the classroom, in my opinion. 
and I certainly encourage the school board as the uh, elected leaders of the school department to ascertain mm -hmm. how best we can invest in our children while balancing the strain that's been put upon some of our citizens by the increased property tax. Because I can assure you, having had two political campaigns in the last two years, I've knocked on many, many, many doors of people who are struggling to pay their property taxes. So we do have to keep that in mind. And uh, I'm very hopeful that we're going to have some changes in Augusta next year uh, and see an end to irresponsible tax shifts. So. Thank you. Councilor Donovan. Well, uh, I guess a week ago last Saturday, uh, being my first year, I had the opportunity to spend uh, about four hours uh, at the uh, school district's workshop, uh, and I just wanted to give people my impressions of that. Uh, it represented, and, and counselors, Blaze and Katerina both joined me in attending this four-hour session, <clears throat> and it was intense. Uh, I think the impressions I came away with are that we have very dedicated, very professional, uh, very competent people running our schools. Uh, we are in a very difficult time, having one of the worst financial crises of uh, the last hundred years, but I don't think that that circumstance should lead to acrimony or diminish our appreciation for what the people who run our schools and our teachers and the quality education that is being delivered in our community. Uh, this will be a difficult time from a budget point of view because we need to exercise restraint. There's just no question. But in the end, I think people should realize that the school department and the Board of Education is doing a very good job. Their job is to try to present the best educational uh, situation for our students, and they're doing that. We are going to have uh, a debate over the next month uh, about financial restraint and budgets and what can we afford. And I am applauding the schools, but also recognizing the reality that we need to exercise restraint. And so I'm, with a little trepidation, going to move forward for the next few weeks while we try and uh, do the best job we can for the community. Thank you. Councilor Holbrook. Sorry I didn't attend the workshop because I was working, so um, I got to pay my tax bill. <laughs> um, but, but certainly, you know, I, I hear good things. I, I hear it was very informative. You know, it was definitely a lot of, a lot of information. Um, so thank you to the counselors that were able to make it. Um, you know, I, I go back to, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm going to say is, you know, I certainly care about the education of the children in this town. Um, and I have kids in there, too, so, you know, and I've said that repeatedly. I, I do care about the, you know, education that they're provided. But I also am also very cognizant of the times that we're in. Um, you know, I come from a long line of folks in town. You, you know, I'm, I'm fifth generation. There's a lot of fingers. There's a lot of roots. There's a lot of people that are neighbors that are neighbors that have been neighbors for generations. There are neighbors that are a third cousin, a fourth cousin. I know this one's been laid off. I know this one's had a pay freeze for five years. I know Social Security is not giving them any money. I know we've had the worst winter in oil prices in history, and it's two, three thousand dollars more to, to heat your home. Um, you know, I, I'm well aware and cognizant of, and, I, and I'm going to say this again, I know this is a small thing for some, but it's detrimental to others, is the circuit breaker. You know, we're asking our residents, you know, <coughs> the state has eliminated it. At best, we might be able to do something on the town side. We're already asking the seniors that got that 
you've lost 1500 I know you can't afford the medications you have. I know you're cutting pills. I know you're cutting corners. I know you're turning your heat down to 62, and you're hanging on with your dear life on a reverse mortgage. Give me, come up with $1,500 to pay that tax bill. That's what I go into this looking with. I appreciate education is important. I appreciate that there are needs on the municipal side. We're not going to get all the needs on the municipal side. And what I'm hoping and asking for the school board to do is I will do as best I can as finance chair on the municipal side of the budget, which is where we control the money. What I am asking for the school board to do is tell me what do you absolutely need. I know you have improvements. I know you have goals for your future. What I'm saying is the now. We have to help these people in the now. It's not something to let go. It's not something to walk away from. But tell me what you absolutely just bare minimum need to share. And then we'll work on cycling that later. Um, so there's my big spiel on budget. And um, something happy, happy Easter on Sunday. And hopefully you catch sight of the bunny leaving little goodies behind. I have just one last thing to um, clink bags. We have a couple clink bags for the town fuel assistance program. As you know, as I just said, um, heating was brutal this year. Um, we are partnered with Project Grace. There are some clink bags over there, which all goes into the town fuel heating assistance program. We still have clink bags at the clerk's office. I promise you we will never run out. <laughs> Colette is on that. I want to thank her from the bottom of my heart. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is we are currently up to 2,377 bottles returned. I wish I could say that was dollars, but that's bottles. Um, I don't know what that equates to. Hopefully there's a lot of 15 centers in there. Um, <laughs> I do want to mention as well, just on the clink thing, um, I, I, ha I was approached. I, I took some bottles back for an elderly neighbor of mine that wasn't able to, you know, do that herself. So. Um, I thought I would put that out there that if you do have maybe some returnables that you'd be happy to donate to the town fuel assistance program, please email me at my town email account. I would be happy to come down and get those for you. Um, so you can email me, you can call me on my, my house phone is the number on the website. It's 834138. Leave me a message. I will come collect them for you if um, you would be kind enough to donate them and aren't able-bodied enough to. Oh, I lied. Okay. I lied. There's one more thing. I just want to, because Tom didn't mention it, um, if you all received the email, which is a really exciting, awesome concept, SEGCO has put together an all-committee mm -hmm. meeting. Um, I, I think that's an absolutely wonderful initiative. They're looking at bringing in a member from each committee within the town that we have, um, for, you know, um, respectively probably the chairs of, of each of those committees. But to bring them all into one room to have a discussion about, you know, how do we all work together? A lot of times projects and initiatives that you're trying to work on in one committee have ties to something else and you know, you know, that sort of thing. So again, this is a great initiative. initiative. I really applaud Karen for putting that together. Um, and I hope that we can have a good showing and a good turnout and maybe have this as an annual annual thing. So, um, now I'm done, I promise. Okay, thank you. Um, also Saturday, I was unable to attend. Um, do because I had to watch the children because my wife had to work to pay the taxes. <laughs> so I was uh, child care Saturday. Um, I wanted to make it known, especially with the budget, with, there's not going to be any dog parks. <laughs> So I keep hearing that brought up. There's no dog parks coming any time soon. I am um, working on preparing, uh, drafting, and I'm still working on it uh, to offer amendments to the uh, animal control ordinance. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on them tonight because I haven't uh, finished, and I will continue that and offer them on May 7th meeting. Um, and they'll be voted on at that time. They're a opportunity to try to uh, come to a consensus on this um, issue in town, um, to try to compromise on it as best we can. 
and uh, try to move on and get the town back on the right track to uh, back to peace and harmony again for the time being. Um, and so I'll have to stay tuned till May 7th when I offer those. Um, other than that, I have... Richard, are, yep. those, are those amendments going to be available to the public prior to the meeting? Yep, yes, they will. Okay. They will. I, as soon as I finish them, um, it's, it's a lot of work, a lot of wording, a lot of wordsmithing. Um, I, you know, um, and we'll see how it goes that night of the vote um, when we vote on it. And um, I think with that, I'm going to wrap it up. My voice is, I've had a, had a cold and had enough talking for tonight. So I'll end it there. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you.